Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline at Pixie Dust PhD. I am filming this on the evening of Friday, February 10th, 2023. That makes this the month 36 creator update. That's right, I have fairly consistently been putting out content on YouTube for three years now, and I am so chuffed at this milestone. In this monthly creator update, we will do a super rapid fire of some news. I was originally gonna skip this, but the Disney Q1 earnings call happened, so there was some things I would like to say real fast. Then we'll do stats and analytics. It will be a little different than usual, but we still will do monthly and lifetime. And then we'll get into some q and I'm gonna try to talk fast so this video isn't super, super long. Probably will be a little longer than usual due to the Q&A, so buckle up and stay tuned. First things first, let's get into that news. So on the bad side, they announced that there will be like 7,000 layoffs company-wide. It sounds like most of these won't be frontline hourly cast members in the parks, but who knows exactly who will be affected. And considering that they reported positive quarterly earnings, always disappointing to see that mass amount of layoffs. Additionally, it wasn't that long ago that Josh Shamara was touting around that they had no shortage of money and they were going to continue investing in things, and yet they continue to refuse to invest in their own people, if you ask me, including, you know, a livable wage. So not only are we not really making progress in pay for the cast members, they're also just laying off 7,000 cast members. In better news, though it may depend slightly on your personal opinion of these franchises, they also announced many things are in the works, including Toy Story 5, Frozen 3, and Zootopia 2. I personally am most excited for Frozen 3. I think they got really close to something genuinely great with Frozen 2. We didn't quite get there, but it was close. So yeah, Frozen 3, I'm really stoked. Toy Story 5, I'll just have to wait and see. I loved Toy Story 1 through 3. Toy Story 4 to me was like a nice movie, but it very much read as a spinoff of like Woody's Tale, the same way kind of Lightyear is a spinoff. So we'll see what Toy Story 5 is. I do love Bonnie and her toys, though I thought that they wrapped up her story very well previously. So, uh. And Zootopia 2 is interesting. I liked Zootopia 1 as a movie. Zootopia 2 could be great. I mean, we don't have any of the plot points yet. Though it is interesting to see this investment in Zootopia in the parks, and then also now we're getting Zootopia 2. Presumably Zootopia 2 has been in the works for a few years. The animated movies don't just pop up out of nowhere. You know, that's like a five-year process usually. So it seems like there's probably some synergy there for sure. They also announced that there will be an Avatar experience coming to Disneyland Resort. They didn't say land, they didn't say ride or attraction. So very open to interpretation if you ask me. I certainly don't think we are seeing full on Pandora, the world of Avatar out in Disneyland. Space is a huge constraint, for example, but will it be a Satouli Canteen? Will it be a Flight of Passage? Who knows? Exciting things for Disneyland. And the last thing I wanted to touch on for Disney news from that earnings call that I haven't seen talked about as widely is that it was said that park capacity for those peak holiday times has actually been reduced by 20% compared to pre-pandemic. I obviously don't go during peak holiday time, so I can't say, you know, if the experience feels 20% better. But if that's that is true, it certainly speaks to the supposed power of the park reservations. There certainly is other relevant news that's been announced in the past month through the Disney Parks blog. For example, the Woody's Barbecue Roundup restaurant menu has been released, but nothing super striking to me otherwise. Let me know how you feel about some of these points from the earnings call, and if there is other big news you want to talk about, leave that in the comments down below. Next, let's move on to stats, and we will start with the usual monthly stats. So these ran from January 11th through February 9th. They are one day short of the full monthly stats period, but I'm trying to get this posted this weekend, i.e. in the next like 24 to 36 hours, so I cut the stats short by a day. I'm pretty stoked to say that I posted a lot of proper videos this month. To kick things off, there was the paying DVC annual dues, both with a credit card and the Disney Rewards Redemption card. Then we had the month 35 creator update. Next was the Disney Vacation Club seven month availability looking at August of 2023. And then we kind of kicked off a series of a bunch of videos about my January trip. First in that series, of course, was the trip announcement, but a lot of that series was actually looking at our advanced dining reservation morning, a live look in at very sleepy 6 a.m. me. And since we weren't fully successful that morning, the next video was taking a look at those free ADR finder services to get a Space 220 reservation. By the time that was all posted, I was already back from the trip. So then my partner Adam and I filmed something real quick on our Festival of the Arts food booth experiences. So both the food and drinks that we had. So we posted a little tasting notes video to give you our opinions on those food booth items. Then there was the pack with me video as well as a theme park cheat sheets video. So sort of how I organize myself for theme park days. And then finally finish the Disneyland Paris vlog series with our last park stay vlog. So I think that's nine videos total, which is like almost twice as much as I would normally post. So a good month in terms of posting for me. I also was posting slightly more shorts on average. I usually only post one a week and I think a bunch of these weeks I was posting two. And a couple of them definitely took off. So here are the top 10 videos for the month. 
The first two are shorts, and then the third one is the disability access service video. Then we have two more shorts rounding out the top five. So of the top five videos, only one of them was a proper video, the other four were shorts. And the top two of those got over 1600 views each, so definitely boosted the view count this month. Then for the bottom five, we've got that DVC seven month availability video, as well as paying DVC annual dues. The Disneyland offsite Hilton Garden Inn room tour is next, then DVC Oki West versus Saratoga Springs, and finally in 10th is that Doubletree room tour over by Universal. The four shorts in the top five were posted this month, as well as the two DVC videos in the sixth and seventh slot. Getting into actual stats for the month, we had almost 10,000 views. We were about 120 short. This came from over 7,000 unique viewers. Definitely those two shorts doing well helped with this count. Happily, 373 of you are returning viewers. Thank you so much. This is a huge rebound from month 35. That upper 300 range is definitely my comfortable spot for returning viewers, and I so appreciate your dedication to the channel, you liking the videos, subscribing to the channel, telling your friends, commenting down below, all of your engagement truly, really does help. These views and unique viewers resulted in over 500 hours of watch time, so definitely not a huge amount by any means, but back to sort of my normal comfortable range. And I had almost 90,000 impressions this month. Again, this is definitely back more in what I would consider my comfortable range of like over 75,000 impressions a month. The past two months have been a little low, but that's kind of typical for that time of year. And my impressions from YouTube was also great this month at 47.5%, definitely a gain over the past few months and pretty close to 50%, which is awesome. Watch time from those not subscribed this month was around 72%, which is nothing amazing, but it definitely was better than last month. But unfortunately, I did only get 24 new subscribers this month, so this is pretty bad in terms of new subscribers, despite the amount of content I was putting out, both real videos and shorts more than average, but hey, maybe that's just how January goes. Over on Twitter, I am following 1,230 accounts, and 1,041 are following me. And on Instagram, I am following 608 accounts, and 410 are following me. And I'm not the best at making actual posts on Instagram. I will forever admit that, but I have been a lot better about posting to my stories. If you're interested in some of the more like mundane day-to-day -day stuff, like what we're eating, happy hours we go to, etc. Moving into lifetime analytics, we're going to do it a little bit different this month. We'll do year one, year two, year three, and then lifetime as well. For views, we're at almost 160,000 views lifetime. And for year three, we got 93,000. Obviously the percent change from year one to year two is going to be massive and we are not going to replicate that from year two to year three, but I still am very proud to see these improvements. Watch hours, we did break 12,000 watch hours this month, which I was a little surprised about just because while well, the past couple months have gone, I wasn't necessarily expecting to get that many watch hours this month. But hooray, over 12,000 now lifetime. And for year three, that is over 6,000 watch hours in the one year. It's not a huge improvement over year two, which was just shy of 5,000 watch hours in the one year, but again, still an improvement and I'm still really happy about that. The channel is nearing 1.8 million impressions a lifetime. And broken up year by year, again, you can see gains year to year and year three being almost a million on its own. Definitely not quite, but we were getting there. So that's a pretty cool number. And perhaps the stat I'm most proud of and you have probably heard me reflect on in the past over these monthly creator updates is the impressions from YouTube. Lifetime, we are at over 33% now, and this is definitely being driven by the year three stat. In year three, this was almost at 40%, which is just like a massive improvement compared to year two, which really wasn't that different from year one. Interestingly though, and a little bit sadly, I think that the number of subscribers from year two to year three is almost identical. <laughs> Granted, I am one day short of this year, but I mean, the point is I didn't really make any gains in this realm. However, we are over 1,150 lifetime, which is a great milestone to hit. But yeah, I'm definitely not seeing any real substantial improvements in the number of subscribers year to year, unfortunately. Here's a look at the top content for year three. This is sorted by views, and you can see that actually half of these are shorts. I believe still more than half of my overall views are from proper videos and not from shorts, but when a short does take off, it can generate quite a lot of views. Then for proper videos, we have the disability access service video, the advanced dining reservation tips and tricks video, the tried and true photo pass video, as well as two room tours. Rather than looking at top content overall for year three, if we narrow in on actual videos, not shorts, here now is the list. Of course, we still have the DOS video, the ADR tips and tricks, photo pass, and then the two room tours. But without those five shorts, that makes room for five actual videos. Those are an interesting mix of topics, if you ask me. We've got seven month DVC availability, but only one from that series, and that was September of 2022. Then we've got the Hilton Garden and Anaheim Resort room tour, so over at Disneyland, and the Beach Club Villa studio room tour. Next is a DVC news video. So this was the top of the world lounge update where they restricted access to full members only. And rounding out the top 10 was a video showing you how you book a DVC trip and really looking at every aspect of the DVC member portal behind that member login. I think worth noting that actually more than half of these weren't even posted during year three. 
you sometimes hear content creators talk about evergreen content, and to me, this is what it's speaking to. You can make content, put it on your channel, and even over a year later, it can continue to rack up views and watch hours for you. This top 10 specifically was sorted by number of views, but I thought it was worth pointing out that you can have a lot of views and still not have very many watch hours. So here I plucked out three videos. If you aren't colorblind, you can see in red that basically, yeah, sure, they made the top 10 in terms of views, but we had very few watch hours. I certainly thought it was interesting to see that two of these three actually were room tours that had a ton of views, but not that many watch hours, even though they aren't super, super short videos. As for other milestones, let's take a look at the videos on the channel with over 1,000 views lifetime. This, I believe, is a list of 29 videos, which blows my mind and I'm so happy about, but I do apologize for the super small font size. In order to get it all on the screen, though, we kind of had to make it small. I'm not going to go through these one by one by any means, but if you are a content creator in the space and want to take a look at topics that have been successful for me, here you go. Also, I'll just briefly say that, of course, I'm really happy about all of the success on the channel, especially these videos, but there still are some surprises for me. For example, I think that the behind the scenes DVC member portal is probably one of the most valuable videos I've ever made. And it took me a ton of time to do it because at the time I had to block out my last name every time a menu came down, as well as like membership numbers and a bunch of other things. So the editing for privacy took a long time. That video really is precisely what I wanted before I bought into Disney Vacation Club and never found anything like it. So even though it has been doing well and it is successful, I am still a little bummed that it's not doing better, honestly. And again, it's worth noting that a bunch of views does not necessarily translate into a bunch of watch hours. My fourth ranked video here is the Doubletree over by Universal Room Tour, but it's only ranked 13th in terms of watch hours. And here I've just highlighted a bunch that have done well views wise, but really not produce a ton of watch hours time. So kind of depends on what stat you're going after. I did not break this down by subscribers. I didn't want to drive myself crazy by trying to look at that stat and figuring out what video got me subscribers and which ones didn't. And while views are nice, I do think watch hours are a little bit of a more important stat, probably. Although there are videos that feel like they underperform in terms of watch hours compared to views, there are also videos that maybe overperform. They might not be ranked the highest in terms of overall views, but people stick around and really watch them. For me, these are all DVC topics, which is great to know because this kind of is a DVC channel. That being said, I am a little surprised that one of the more successful videos on the channel is just my partner and I ranking DVC home resorts for where we would buy a home resort contract. I'm not sure what's so interesting about hearing our opinions. It's nice to know people like it, but of all the things I put out on the channel, that's not necessarily that informative. And it's just like funny in a little bit of a sad way to me that that is a video that hit. Switching gears a little, now we're looking at the lifetime top videos by watch hours. So these are the videos with more than 200 watch hours. Significantly fewer here compared to that last set of slides with the number of videos with more than 1,000 views. This definitely is a good mix of topics, but I would say it still leans pretty heavily toward Disney Vacation Club, which I am not mad about. And in terms of balancing watch hours and views, the only one that really stuck out to me here was the Disney Vacation Club 7-month availability in September 2022. This had over 250 watch hours, but only about 1,300 views, which is not as many as you might expect. But it is nice to know people were hanging around for that video at least. Interestingly, though, this trend is not recapitulated for any of the rest of the videos in that series. We have done several more videos of looking at seven month availability at Disney Vacation Club because it seems like people like them. But the stats kind of indicate that this one for September 2022, which I believe was the first in the series that I posted, was the hit and the rest are not as impactful. Moving away from standard stats, let's go ahead and look at revenue. For month 36, it's estimated that I made about $27. This is a little under $6 for every thousand watches in general, and not quite $13 for every thousand view ads. And if you look at the month by month breakdown, again, this is not the best month. It seems like maybe $30 a month is pretty average for me, dollar a day. It's not great, but I'm not going to complain. It certainly is starting to feel like, though, that October was a fluke of a really good month for me, which is a little unfortunate because that was like the first full month that I was monetized. And so in my head, I was like, oh, maybe this is a normal month. Maybe not. <laughs> Lifetime, I am estimated at shy of $180 in revenue. This is about $1.50 for 1,000 views overall and a little under $18 per 1,000 ad views. I thought it was interesting though and worth noting that about 23% of my overall estimated revenue is coming from one single video. It is that disability access service video. For updates on my longer term revenue goals, really nothing to say this month. I didn't buy anything for the channel, I didn't join any Patreons, and I haven't gotten another paycheck as I do think you need to hit $100 minimum to be paid. I think my next goal will be saving up to buy a gimbal because I think it would just be really nice to have a gimbal to take footage with when I am out and about in the parks. And finally, for the standard updates, let's go over some probable or possible content for month 37. It's going to be fairly focused on my January 2023 trip. However, now that the Disneyland Paris Parks Day vlogs are all posted, I can also do the Disneyland Paris Highlights and Lowlights recap video that my partner and I filmed. Then there will be a quick like one minute trip trailer for the January 2023 trip. 
And from there, we're roughly going to go in order of the January trip. So it'll be our arrival day where we had dinner at Toledo. I'm excited to share that vlog with you. I did film an updated Bay Lake Tower room tour, so you'll see that. Then I think next will be our Steakhouse 71 lunch. Also, this is pure speculation, but I'm hoping that in the next monthly period, if not shortly thereafter, I'll be able to post some very exciting DVC news. We really haven't heard much about the Disneyland Hotel DVC Tower recently, but in my opinion, we should be hearing soon. If you look back at how Riviera went, those sales started at the end of March that year. Then Riviera officially opened mid-December. So if we are expecting the Disneyland Hotel DVC Tower to open super end of fall, like that mid-December timeframe, then why wouldn't we have news soon? I certainly am hopeful. Again, I don't actually know anything. This is total speculation, but maybe there will be some exciting DVC news to come. Other than the number of new subscribers overall, I felt like month 36 was pretty successful and I'm really proud of what I was able to put out this month. And looking at the stats for the entire year together, looking at year three as a whole definitely warms my heart. I definitely didn't make huge gains from year two to year three and a lot of those key stats by any means, but there still were improvements and it's also just really cool to see an entire year's worth of stats together. Let's move into Q&A then. Before we get started, I'd like to provide a brief warning. I don't think I'm going to say anything inappropriate per se, but I may bring up topics or concepts that if you have littles in the room and they overhear those words, they might ask you what those words mean, and maybe you don't want to explain that to them yet. That's your official warning that if you have this on while littles are around, maybe you want to pause and come back or shuffle them off to another room. I am filming this in the evening. My partner and I already went to a happy hour and came back home, so a little truth serum for me. And thanks so much to everyone who submitted questions. I really appreciate it. Before we get into detailed questions, I had a lot of basic questions about who I am, who my partner is, that kind of stuff, so we'll go over that really quickly. If you are not new around here, you can check the timestamps in the description down below and skip this part probably. But hi to everyone who is new and joined in the last year. I so appreciate that you're here. My name is Jacqueline. I go by Jacqueline, not Jackie, not any other nickname. And yes, I do actually have a PhD. My entire educational and research history is in biomedical engineering, so it's not directly related to Disney, but I certainly know how to research a topic very thoroughly. The jobs I've had post-PhD are outside of bench science, so I'm no longer in the lab pipetting liquids or anything but the jobs I've had do require a science PhD, so it is being put well to use. My partner and I currently live in the Washington DC area. We have been together for about nine years now. We have a dog together. We do not have children. We do not plan to have children. Frankly, the reasons are personal between us. That's kind of the end of the story I'm willing to share. My partner is not a scientist. He works in a totally different field and he did not go to grad school. We both work very demanding salary jobs in our respective industries, so that's where a lot of our time and efforts go. We've had our dog for about six years now. Her breed is a caisson. We do keep her name to ourselves because it's extremely unique. And if you Google like her name and my name, a little too much private information comes up. But she's super fluffy, super cute, and a very fun girl to be around most of the time. On to more specific questions. We'll start with those about being a YouTube or content creator. Justin Monorel asks, what's something I've learned over the past three years of making content that I wish I'd known before? I definitely would say the power of good audio. So the early videos I was just filming on a point and shoot camera. Of course it could film video and it has a mic, but it's not a good mic by any means. The audio is totally fine, but once I finally did buy a mic, the audio quality is just like so vastly improved and I absolutely think it was worth it. And fun fact, the first mic I bought for the channel was actually a recommendation from Justin. So thanks so much, friend. I don't necessarily think you need super high quality audio to start a channel by any means, but it definitely does add a lot. And that first mic I bought was only about $50. So when you consider the use I'm getting out of it, it's a pretty good investment. The other thing I'd say is I assumed that at the start, editing took me so long because I was new to it and clumsy and I didn't know what I was doing. And I definitely do know what I'm doing now, but editing still does take a long time. There kind of just is no getting around the fact that there is a minimum amount of time spent editing for me and it's never going to be like 30 minutes. An anonymous Instagram user asked what they needed to start a channel. And I would say you really don't need much. You're gonna need something to film video on. If you've got a good enough smartphone, that will be totally fine. And honestly, if you're filming videos at home like this, even just the native mic on your smartphone will probably be good enough. You will need something to prop your phone or camera up on. So when I first started, I did buy a tripod and I do think that was pretty necessary. But other than something to film video on, probably your phone and ideally some type of tripod that's got an adjustable height, just start. Getting started was the hardest part in my opinion and learning to be neutral to comfortable with listening to myself and editing my face all the time was definitely a hurdle. But I'm always striving for body neutrality and honestly, I think this hobby has helped more than it's hurt. Either Jen or Frank Cardillo of the Dills Diz asked if I had any advice for those just joining the YouTube or the Disney community. I'd say first and foremost, always try to be as authentic as possible. Don't be putting out videos or content just because you think that's what people want to see. Do things for you. But second, I think really take up the platform that you're most comfortable with. For me, honestly, that's Twitter. 
And yes, my Twitter and my YouTube are very inherently linked, but I am on Twitter a lot more. I talk to people on Twitter more, I would argue. Twitter is something that I have had in my day-to-day -day life for probably almost half my life now. It's just a platform I like a lot and it works well for me. That's where I've made most of my best connections with people over on Twitter, not necessarily YouTube, definitely not Instagram. So to some extent, sticking with what you're comfortable with will really help you launch whatever this side venture or hobby is. Another anonymous user on Instagram asked me to reflect on my revenue a bit. I've been very transparent about my revenue thus far, and it hasn't been that long since I have been eligible for revenue. It's definitely low. I mean, I wish I was making more than a dollar a day, of course, but it's a side venture. I'm happy to be getting anything out of it. It's really a hobby. So eh. I think if anything, my main reflection is you want to be realistic going into this. If you think you're doing YouTube for the money, that's unlikely. It's very hard to do YouTube full time, especially just from ad revenue. From what I understand, most of the people who do this full time have side revenue through collaborations with companies. They're getting sponsorships, basically. I'm definitely nowhere near that. So I basically just got the ad revenue and yeah, it's nice to get something instead of nothing, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it's changing my life. And finally, a slew of folks asked why I don't follow them back on Twitter or Instagram or subscribe to their YouTube. There are a variety of reasons. Here are the top several. If I'm not subscribed to you on YouTube, I probably just don't even know that your channel exists. So feel free to let me know it does and I'll take a look and probably hit subscribe. As far as Twitter and Instagram, if you have a private account, I'm pretty much never going to request to follow that. To me, having a private account is a clear boundary of like only people I know in real life should be following me. And for the most part, that's not the case with me and you. Additionally, on Twitter, I do try to scroll through people's feeds to see sort of what they're about before following them. If you don't post or you pretty much only ever retweet things and you don't add your own thoughts, you're not adding to the conversation, then I'm probably not going to follow you back. For me, Twitter really is about having conversations with people and establishing connections. If all you're really ever doing is retweeting other accounts, then we can't really chat, can we? Over on Instagram, it kind of depends on what you post. Not that I only want to follow Disney accounts, but again, it gets to this point of like, I don't actually know you, so it gets weird if I'm following your personal Instagram sometimes. At PixieDustPhD on Instagram clearly is my Disney account. It's not my everyday life account. I totally understand that most of you just have one account, not multiple, and that makes perfect sense to me. But if over on your everyday life account, you're typically only posting pictures of your kids, which I get why you want to do that and savor those memories. Again, like we're strangers and I feel a little bit weird creeping on your kids on a day-to-day -day basis, so I'm probably not going to follow you. And finally, for all social media platforms, I do try to scroll through your content briefly to see what you're about. And if there are any signs of homophobia or misogyny or ableism or racism, etc., then I'm not going to follow you back or not on good terms. That's not energy I want to invite into my life or support by any means. I would say those are the main things that stop me from following people back. If you are a private account and you genuinely want me to follow you, just let me know. I will request it. But mostly it's me trying to respect boundaries and trying to protect my mental health. Next, let's move into miscellaneous questions. I think most of which came from Tara. Thanks so much for submitting these. She asked, what's our favorite thing to cook at home? That's a really good question. Adam makes a really mean steak. And if steak is on sale, we tend to pick it up. So steak and potatoes, big hit. I also am a pretty big fan of homemade focaccia, which we use as focaccia for bread, but we also make focaccia croutons from now. And then tonkatsu and dumplings is a go-to comfort meal for me. And we've gotten pretty good at making carbonara at home too. There's been several suggestions to get more of Adam on the channel cooking and making drinks and stuff. And I appreciate it and makes him blush, but he's pretty not on the internet. So we'll see. I bring it up sometimes, but I don't know about that. And certainly our kitchen is not set up to do beautiful kitchen shoots like you see on Babish Culinary Universe or anything. I had a couple of people inquire as to what my favorite alcoholic drink is, and that is so hard to say. I will say when we go to a new bar, I'll often order the daiquiri as a test if the bartender is good. Margarita is also a good test for this. When done well, those drinks are fantastic, but they can just be so sugary, saccharine, sweet, nasty. It's a good litmus test. I love a good whiskey smash. I love a French 75 and I love a good rosé champagne. Chenin Blanc is also one of my favorite wines. Tara asks, what is my favorite museum in DC? And I'm going to cheat a little bit and say the Smithsonian National Zoo. Maybe you don't consider it a museum, but it is under the Smithsonian branch. I do also really like the botanical gardens down on the National Mall, which I think should count as a museum. For real museums, the Renwick Gallery is great. I also like the Hirschhorn. These are art galleries. Then I don't typically go to these on my own because when we have friends come into town, it seems like they always want to go. But of course, the Air and Space Museum and the Natural History Museum are true gems. And I had a couple of people inquire about our sports fandoms. My big sports, I would say, are baseball, hockey, college gymnastics, pro gymnastics, and college football. Adam's big sports, I would say, are probably 
college basketball, soccer, but mostly the EPL, not necessarily every league or MLS or NWSL, et cetera. Definitely the EPL. And to some extent, also pro football, pro basketball, pro baseball. So we kind of cover the gamut. My favorite to watch is probably college gymnastics. I find it really exciting, although the scoring drives me a little bit crazy, but it's just super dynamic, very fun. My favorite sport to watch live, though, I would say is hockey. If you get a decent seat, you can really see the whole ice and feel all the action. That's definitely not true when you're going to see gymnastics or football live. Let's move on to Walt Disney World and general theme park questions. Tara asked, what Disney restaurant am I excited to try for the first time? And I think we've done a lot of my bucket list restaurants, but I do want to make our way over to GCO someday. It's hard for me to justify that price tag, but I've heard that it is amazing. I've also not done Cinderella Royal Table as an adult, and I am interested. I realize the food will probably not be good, but I think that's going to be about the experience for me. Lauren asked what's on my theme park bucket list and what's something I wouldn't do again. I think there's a lot of things I wouldn't do again. <laughs> For the most part, that just becomes a time or cost factor for me. It's not that anything is so bad I wouldn't do it again, but like, do I need to do it again? Not really. This is a very unpopular opinion, but for example, Flight of Passage. If we don't have Genie Plus and we don't get a lightning lane or the wait is not super short, which standby usually isn't, like, I just don't think it's worth it. When we went in 2019 with friends, we had friends that waited like two and a half hours to go on that ride. And I said, peace, have a good time. And I went and did other things. <laughs> also, as much as possible, I try to minimize my use of Walt Disney World Transit. We don't always do this because, of course, sometimes it seems convenient to take it or we don't have a rental car and don't want to pay for the ride share, etc. But gosh, every time I am on a monorail, I find myself so frustrated. <laughs> There's also a specific margarita we got at Chosa Margarita, the outside margarita stand in the Mexico Pavilion at Epcot that I thought was genuinely awful. And I think it was like $17, so I would never get that again. There's no redeeming that one for me. In terms of bucket list, we did actually make a whole video about this and we haven't done most of those things yet. A big theme for me is, again, it kind of comes down to time. So there's a lot of the like extra tour or specialty items I want to do. You know, Keys to the Kingdom looks really cool. There's the Wild Africa Trek. But you're paying for your day ticket on top of paying for your ticket to this tour or extra experience, which as a non-pass holder, I just find really hard to justify. I would love to do a VIP tour one day. I think that seems super fun. And of course, I don't think this will ever happen, but it would be awesome to go to Club 33. Tara asks, what is a character I've not met before that I would most like to meet? At the moment, it's definitely Raya. <laughs> she doesn't have a standard meet and greet in Disney World. She was meeting in Disney Land Resort in California, but not when I was there, unfortunately. I missed her by a couple days. But yeah, Raya from Raya and the Last Dragon, very high on my list. Rare characters is one of the few things where my heartstrings get pulled a little bit in terms of becoming a full DDC member, because if you go to Moonlight Magic, they often have pretty rare characters. And I love meeting characters, so that's definitely a pull. Similar for Disney Cruise Line, which I generally have no interest in doing except for the characters. <laughs> Ugh, yeah. Also, currently, I don't think there's ever been a character for Cassandra from Tangled the Series, but if they ever had a cast character, oh my gosh, I would be so stoked to meet her. Tara also asked what one of my favorite character interactions has been, and there's been a lot of really good ones. I always like asking Peter Pan why there's only lost boys and where are all the lost girls, and it's fun to see what Pan has to say about that. Bouncing with Tigger is also always a good one. And I love meeting Chip and Dale because they're very mischievous. And I usually ask if I can boop their nose. And we do like a, a nose to nose thing. And it's super cute. But probably my favorite of all time thus far is once when I met Merida, I told her that I was having a hard time finding Will-O-Wisps. And we had a really good conversation about how I probably don't want to find Will-O-Wisps because they come to you when you are in a little bit of strife. And she had this terrible experience with them. And they took her to a witch and all these things. So yeah, Merida is super cheeky and really fun too. Finally, in this theme, I had an anonymous user ask me what I thought of quote unquote Disney adults. Honestly, I kind of feel like this is bait. <laughs> what I will say is I think most stereotypes exist for some aspect of a reason. There's usually a grain of truth in there. The Disney adult stereotype is kind of whatever. Some stereotypes obviously are extremely harmful towards those group of people, whether that's a religion or a race or a sex, anything like that. Personally, I don't think that the stereotype against Disney adults can be used in such a harmful manner against that group of people like it can be used against various identities. So frankly, I think it's a little bit silly overall. But yeah, I think there are some people I would classify as Disney adults that could use a little bit of a dose of reality. Like I said, this a little bit feels like bait. If people are genuinely interested in hearing my thoughts about this, leave a comment down below and I'll consider making an actual video. But for now, since it was only asked by one person and they happen to be anonymous, we will move on. Finally, Disney Vacation Club themed questions. 
Adam from the Mouse and More podcast, if you haven't checked that out, I will link to it in the description below. Very fun podcast. Asked what my favorite DVC resort I've stayed at so far is. I know this is a lame answer, but I'm pretty sure it's Bay Lake Tower. <laughs> For me, nothing really beats being able to walk from my room into the Magic Kingdom in 10 minutes and the security line is like nothing. Plus the views even from a standard view room can be pretty sweet. I haven't stayed in a DVC resort I disliked, so there is that. But yeah, I picked Bay Lake Tower as my home resort for a reason, for the thing that matters most to me, which is I hate the transit into Magic Kingdom. And so now I can just walk and it is a beautiful experience. <laughs> I will say though, that I've also really enjoyed the Savannah View Rooms at Animal Kingdom Lodge. That's something that I don't think you can generally replicate, definitely not at other theme parks, but maybe not anywhere else overall. Having that Savannah View balcony is just so peaceful. And obviously I love Zeus, so no complaints from me. Shannon asked if I had any desire to add more DVC points, and I would say generally no. For those of you who don't know, I have a home resort contract at Bay Lake Tower and it's 90 points. My partner and I tend to only travel with the two of us and we tend to only go to Walt Disney World for a longer period of time every other year. So between banking and borrowing points, 90 points is plenty to book studios. When we bought the contract, it was stripped, so I didn't have any points to bank from. So we had that use years points and then the next use years points to borrow from, though at the time there was the 50% limit. So for our 2021 trip, we spent all of those points. It was the 90 points from the current use year, 45 because of that 50% limit from the next use year. And I think we ended up buying two or three vacation points at the rack rate. For booking studios, not going during peak times when rooms are the most expensive, that was plenty. And we're planning our longer upcoming trip for later in 2023, with which we had some of the points that we could bank into this year, this year's, year's points, and then all of next year's, year's points. And yeah, that's proving to work out just fine for us. Certainly, occasionally, I do wish we had more points, particularly when it comes to that seven month time frame. If we had more points to be more flexible to book one bedrooms instead of studios, it would just be a lot simpler. But getting one bedrooms is absolutely not a necessity for us, since again, it's really just the two of us traveling. That being said, this ties into the next question about if I am planning on buying into the Disneyland Resort DVC Tower. And ultimately, while I feel like I do not need more points per se, I do want to have the ability to stay at Disneyland on DVC points, which if you're trying to stay seven months at Grand Californian, best of luck to you. So yeah, I am basically planning to buy into the Disneyland DVC Tower. A lot of that is still pending in terms of the price per point, as well as any promotions they're running. If you buy a certain amount of points, you get $20 off or whatever. Plus, of course, the points charts and the dues per point. I have no idea how many points we're going to buy. It's possible we buy 150 and become real DVC members. It's possible we buy less. Who knows? If prices are really outrageous, maybe we don't buy anything at all. I am from the West Coast originally, though, and I want to make my way back out there eventually. We don't have any solid plans by any means. But yeah, knowing that I want to live out there at some point means Disneyland Resort will probably become our home park. And then if we could use DVC points to stay there reasonably, I would prefer that. Overall, no, I don't think we need more points, but yes, I'm probably going to buy more points. This is definitely more about location, though, than the points themselves. I believe those were all the questions that were submitted. Again, thanks so much to everyone who did participate. No matter what else, this year three time frame was the time that I hit 1,000 subscribers, which will always be so incredibly special to me, and I could not have done it without you. Thank you so much. May the rest of your day be magical, and we'll see you real soon at Pixie Dust PhD. 